Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted to be joined by Chris Toll. Chris, welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. Thanks very much for having me man. It's an absolute pleasure. I've been enjoying your own podcast which we'll talk about in a, a wee minute or two but you're sporting a, a jersey that is very dear to my own Celtic supporting memories the centenary season. Chris, when did you get into actually going to the games and watching Celtic yourself? My first season ticket, um, I, my dad had been taking me to the games since I was seven or something. Um, the first, my very first ever Celtic game was uh, the St. Patrick's Day Massacre. <laughs> so it was the very first game that he took me to um, was that, an old firm game. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take my boy in for him game straight away. Do you know what I mean? But uh, my dad, my dad took me to that, and we, we beat Rangers soundly. It was either that, or it was the week before. I went to two old firm games for my first two Celtic games, and we beat them twice. And I was like, "This is a doddle. How do they keep winning the week?" You know. <laughs> but um, honestly, man, it was from there on. They took me to Dortmund. It was I told the story on football daft, but it was. Uh, Basically, what had happened was Paul McStay had turned up across the street from my house, and we went. Uh, me and my mates were playing football outside, and when he came out of the house that he was in, I says, "Oh, I'm going to Dortmund with you next week." And he's, he's like, "All right, all right, no problem." He says, "I tell you what, if I see you in the departure lounge, I'll buy you a sweetie." I was like, "All right, okay." So we went, and I, my dad got it all booked up and stuff like that. And we were flying with the official party. We were on the flight with the players and stuff like that. And we were sitting in the, the departure lounge and Paul McStay comes through. I was like, ah, waving, hiya, told you. He took me on to John Menzies and filmed me for a sweeties and magazines and all that. And Brilliant. Brilliant. The, the, the whole squad really took me under their wing, to be honest with you, man. I've, I, was looking up all, I was looking out all the 40s a couple of weeks ago and some of the players that, that were on the trips, I mean, like the, the second one we went to was Lisbon. We went to... Celtic versus Sport in Lisbon mm-hmm. and obviously we had been Lisbon all the Lisbon Lions were on the flight as well you know what I mean so like we were sitting with Jinky and, and Bobby Lennox and Bobby Murdoch and Bertie Old and all them and Big Billy and the whole lot of them were there all the ones that were that were still ways at the time were there and um, in fact I think they were all there actually I don't think any of them had went yet I don't think any of them had passed away yet and uh I've got 40s with them all and we've got all the signatures still and my dad's got everything all the way up on the walls and he's and he's bar in the house, man. It's the memories that I've got for being a child and being a Celtic fan, it's something that can never be replaced, you know what I mean, with anything else at all. You know yourself, growing up growing up as a Celtic fan, you it's like it's indoctrinated, isn't you? You know what I mean? It's like it, in school, everything. It's all your pals are Celtic fans, but there's always that one. And no, there's always that one that's not a Celtic fan. <laughs> used to dish it out to us every week. Rangers were winning everything that was going at this time. And he used to dish it out to us every week. And I remember we seen him the day that Celtic done the treble under Martin O'Neill. He was walking by my house and me and all my mates were watching the Scottish Cup final in my house. I've never seen him move as quick in his life, man. Honestly, he went by as like a train. <laughs> but it was, it's just, for a, for a very young age... How I got into Celtic actually was, was my dad had been like trying to kind of press it on me and press it on me and press it on me. And it was my Holy Communion. It was the day I made my Holy Communion. And he took me into uh, the Forge in Parkhead and he took me into Sports Division. He's like, pick any football top you want. I said, right, no bother. And it just so happened I picked the Celtic Holy Top. And right. see, when I look back, it was the ugliest fucking thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But when you're a kid, you love all that gary shit. And I was like, right, that's the one for me. And uh, he bought me that. And then ever since then, I just started supporting Celtic. It was, like I say, it's in your, it's in your blood, man. And, and you, uh, it's, it's across the bear at times, don't get me wrong. It's across the bear at times. But it's, again, you wouldn't change it for the world, would you? No, and great memories, you know, travelling with the squad. Not just the squad, but the Lions as well. And those two games, actually, I mean, we weren't, in the best of shape back in the early 90s there Chris but every so often we were able to pull off a, a memorable result the St Patrick's Day Massacre that you mentioned but even the, the Dortmund two legs against them they had uh, Sharp was that didn't they he was a big Swiss uh, uh, Sharp was that um, I don't, you know I don't really remember much about the game to be honest with you I remember being in the stadium I don't remember much about the game mm-hmm. um, but they had what, what a side Dortmund had even back then you know what I mean and Murdoch McLeod was 
he was like the go between between the two clubs. Right. And when we all when we all got there, Dortmund had arranged a big, a massive uh, street party in the square just for the Celtic fans. But all the Dortmund fans turned up as well, and there, there wasn't even any police. Everybody just had a, a big party, and that's really when the the kind of relationship between the two clubs started. And Murdo McLeod was the ambassador for both, and he was organising all of that and everything. And we had him on the show um, a couple of weeks ago, and he doesn't remember a bloody thing about it, but what are you going to do, you know what I mean? He's <laughs> <laughs> got greater memories in football than putting on a street party for me. It's incredible, Chris, because you speak to ex-players and uh, anoraks like me that know the facts and we've got all the, the history books, but then you speak to somebody like Danny McGrain, he's just like, Paul, I, I don't remember that. I played 600 games. How am I meant to remember that? But as fans, you're just so focused and obsessed with Celtic that you remember everything, you know? Well, that's the thing, but uh, do you remember every time you've done the dishes? Because I don't, <laughs> and I don't think I've done the dishes 600 times, mate. So <laughs> 600 games for Celtic, it's all going to melt into one slightly, I would think. But I'll tell you what, I bet you remember Love Street. Well, he does. Aye, and if you ask him about that goal, you know, the, the goal where him and McStay and McLaren and set up Morris Johnson. But McGrain talks about that goal from start to finish, Chris. One of the finest goals in the history of the club. These things you say about being Celtic, you're indoctrinated into the club and you definitely are. But during the, that period, you know, the nine in a row that, that Rangers won, at any point did you ever think, I'm going to enjoy a nine in a row in my lifetime? Did that ever cross your mind? Do you know what? I'll tell you a story. It's, a, it's along the same kind of lines, right? I, um, we went on holiday uh, when I was about 13 or 14, right? And we had a really bad flight. And I went like, ah, do you know what? I'm never going on a plane again unless Celtic are in a European final. And I was thinking that I was safe as fucking houses. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then when we get when we get into uh, the UEFA Cup final, and my dad says, right, we're putting up to go to Seville. And I, I Mars was making buttons, I'll be honest with you. But I got there. I got there in the end. But that's something I never thought I'd see. I never thought I'd see in a European final. So see, to be honest with you, see when it's Celtic, you can't really write anything off. When Rangers, when Rangers uh, went down into the lower leagues, um, I phoned the bookies and I says, give me a price on Celtic for 10 in a row. Right? And bear in mind, we'd only, what was it, one we had done? Yeah. We had done one. Do you know what odds you gave me? 3-1. 3-1? So I think the, the bookies foreseen this nine in a row. Mm-hmm. So... I I think we've we've landed well. We've landed well. It's uh, this season's obviously a bit uh, contentious, but you know what? Uh, Celtic. I, I could I could only see the gap getting wider between Celtic and Rangers this season. And if the shoe was in the other foot, I'd be shouting and balling. And I can understand why the Rangers fans are shouting and balling. But you know, for the safe for safety's sake, and for just for you know, what social peace and quiet, just mm-hmm. get it swiped out of the way, get out of the way, start again next season, and if they're good enough, then we'll not get 10 in a row. But I'm telling you this, they're not good enough, and we're going to get 10 in a row, and then we're going to get 11 in a row. And then see, once we get to 55 before them, that's when the unrest will begin. <laughs> Well, this is the thing. I mean, there's a point where it creeps up on you. And I remember the the famous stop in the 10 under Vim Janssen. And, you know, when they're at four and five in a row and Celtic are bringing in new managers and all that kind of thing, Chris, you think, it's all right, it's going to work out, we'll get somebody in and it'll be fine. But then once you're, you're moving into the seven and the eight territory, and then it becomes realistic that they're going to win 10 in a row at that point. And we, we really had to move mountains to, to stop that from happening. I don't think, like yourself, I just don't think Rangers have got the, the foundations at the moment that they're, they're going to challenge Celtic. My biggest worry, I suppose, is we've been hearing horror stories, Chris, about some teams like Dunfermline paying off 17 first-team players. Hearts have been saying that you know they're going to be facing financial ruin. And my biggest concern is the future, really, of Scottish football because it'd be great if this all passed and we got back to it, season tickets, going to the games... But I just think there's going to be a lot of casualties, unfortunately, and Celtic being this massive, colossal business that they now are, I think they'll have one eye elsewhere and they might be looking to move out of Scottish football. How gutted or how sad would you be if that was to happen? I would be absolutely devastated, mate. Like I say, 
Scottish football is as much indoctrinated into you as Celtic is. You know, I mean, we've, we've seen we've seen Scottish football facing hardship a lot of times. You know what I mean? But I'll be honest with you, I don't think it would get to that. I don't, I don't think it, it could get to that. If you lose, there is a possibility that a few teams might go to the wall. But then you look at the possibility of them maybe amalgamating and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, and that then allows maybe teams for the for the amateur leagues or the, sorry, the, the former junior league. To then come through, teams that have got better finances, they've got a better uh, infrastructure in place. I mean, you look at teams like Spartans and even Kelty Hearts and stuff like that. They've got they've got uh, businesses in place that are far and away better than a lot of the teams in the Scottish football league. Mm-hmm. And it, the sooner that teams like that come in, then it's only going to make the game stronger. And you never know; it could it could work out for Scottish football in the long run. It, be a better thing than than if we had the same. I mean, you look at Breakin have Breakin have avoided relegation this season, right? Um, Kelly Hearts and I'm not sure who's the other who's the other team again. Brora Rangers. Uh, Brora Rangers and uh, Kelly Hearts. You know, they they two teams would come in and they would add to the Scottish League the same way that Cove done mm-hmm. last season. They would add that they, they make a stronger team, the league stronger altogether. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think they. The pyramid system, the way it, the way it's set up, it's set up to make your national game as strong as possible, you know. So the the cream will rise to the top, and unfortunately there'll be a, a few casualties in the wayside. But mm-hmm. I think in the long run it could potentially be better for Scottish football. You mentioned something that, to be honest with you, I'm the the ever optimist, Chris. You mentioned that when Celtic's involved, anything's possible. And I've been looking at, obviously, the Seville run and Martin O'Neill learning a lot by his own admission from Brian Clough, who won the European Cup twice. Neil Lennon's obviously learned a lot from O'Neill. He he calls him his biggest inspiration throughout his career. And then I'm looking at last season, and there was glimpses that Neil Lennon knew how to progress in Europe. Do you think that that, coupled with the fact that there's going to be this big, great leveller across the globe financially uh, over the next months and years, Chris, do you think Celtic might be able to progress further next season? I mean, this season was brilliant in, in spells. The two Lazio games were just incredible. What you're, what you're going to need to remember is it, it's, not, it's not just Scottish football that's going to be affected by this, you know? And there might there might be some big hitters that start to struggle. Mm-hmm. And if they start to struggle, then they're not going to be able to afford your Cristiano Ronaldo's and your Messi's and stuff like that, you know what I mean? So that then is going to, again, that'll bleed through the game it'll balance teams out more because other teams will be able to afford a higher calibre of player than the, than some other teams can, you know. And hopefully, in the long run, it'll benefit Celtic because Celtic are, Celtic have got a lot of money, right? Let's be honest, that Celtic have got a lot of money by Scottish football standards, but we don't have a lot of money by European football standards. Mm-hmm. You know, see when you're looking at teams in the English Championship paying 15 and £20 million pounds for players, eh, we, we could only dream of that. You know, and if we did buy a player for fifteen million, it would be because we sell one for thirty. Yeah. And and when do we ever do that? Do you know what I mean? We get this money and and it goes in that pocket, and then you never see it again. And I don't know, I don't know what's going to what's going to happen. Hopefully, if Celtic see a chance to progress, and then they might loosen the purse strings a wee bit, get a few more. Not obviously not top end of European football players, but young up and coming players like. Not project players, but players that are good enough and young enough that can go into the team, improve the, the start my living. And then you never know, man, you, we could have another Seville season where it just the stars line up and every team's got a V in its name. <laughs> well, listen, I believe I believe that kind of thing when it comes to Celtic like yourself, Chris. I mean, I've been watching your, your podcast. The lockdown's obviously been difficult for a lot of people and things like podcasts and, and video shows and all that, Chris, are brilliant. And I've been watching your podcast and uh, obviously you're the Celtic fan. Your two co-presenters are both well-known celebrity Rangers fans. You've got Stephen Purden and uh, Grado. But to be fair, you really hold your own on that show. How difficult is it for you? Well, do you know what? It's, it's not really difficult because they always, they always set me up. They're, they're daft. They, like I give them a wee bit of bait and then they come back with what I'm wanting them to come back with and then I get my thing. I bang right in straight away. Make them look like a pair of arseholes, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, you know what? It, that's the thing. It, the, 
the two of them are my mates, and like I say, it's no, it's no me doing a, a podcast with two Rangers fans. It's me doing a podcast with two of my mates that just so happen to be Rangers fans, and I think that comes through because I think you can see that there's a there's a good bond between the three. Is and John as well, the producer. John, he's a great guy. Um, he he's a Fall Cup fan, though, so um, he doesn't count. <laughs> But I, it's, I, I'm loving doing it, to be honest with you, and it's great to, I mean, some of the guests that we've had on have been brilliant, you know, um, we've had a few, a few Celtic, ex-Celtic player guests, we've had uh, Tony Watt, we've had uh, Frank McAvenny, who else have we had? Um, we've had Murdo McLeod, like I said earlier, yeah. um, we've had a couple of Rangers players as well, a couple of ex-Rangers players, but the, my favourite ones are the, are the guests for the War Weeks, we had Dick Campbell, right, and he was funny as fuck, man. He's a Honestly, funny guy. Uh, he, he's a pure legend in Scottish football, and he's like kind of, kind of along the same mould as John Lambie, isn't he? Oh, aye, aye. You just get that proper old school standing in the 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 terraces, kind of feeling off him. And he was just like he was a great guest. But doing the doing the show, it's it's not it's not too hard because, like I say, they they always they always take a bait, man. It's easy. It's easy, they take a bait, but that's the thing, it's the typical Rangers fan, man. You're right, I, I seen you winding Barry Ferguson up, you just walked right into it, and it was it was funny though, because the points you were making, the points you were making were actually true, it's not as if you were just uh, winding them up for the, the, the same. Oh, I know, I know, I know, <laughs> along, for the day, along for the day that we get Alex Ray on, because I'll tear ribbons off him. Well, there was actually an occasion that uh, through me sponsoring the Celtic Old Boys team, through the podcast, I get a game now and again, well, Frank McGarvey gives me 10 and 15 minutes here and there. And there was one occasion we were playing, Grado was playing for Rangers, and uh, Alex Ray was playing, and I snapped him. It was a, a, a real dullion, Chris. Like, it probably looked deliberate, but it was just due to my lack of ability and my lack of pace. And I snapped him, and he, I think he was wanting to fight me. But it's one of the ones where, where Ray, I think you get the kudos for the Celtic fans for snapping him, but at the same time, I didn't quite fancy it when he stood up with that look in his face and he was going to come for me, like, you know. But that can get a bit hairy. Him and Simon Donnelly go toe-to-toe. We Donnelly's had him by the neck and all that. This is a bounce game at a junior football park. Simon Donnelly? Simon Donnelly, aye. We said, aye. That's like me trying to fight Alex Ray. <laughs> we said. Aye, he didn't back down. He didn't back down. I said, boy, good on him. But it's a, it's a good it's a good crack. But I'm wondering, I mean, the, the whole wrestling thing, I mean, when I go back to my youth, I remember, you know, Hulkamania, the Ultimate Warrior, all that kind of stuff. But it was only really when I'd, I'd seen this guy Grado and I'm thinking, is wrestling still a thing? And uh, obviously it is, and it's hugely popular. Chris, tell us how you got introduced to the wrestling game. Um, it's a funny story, actually. What happened was I was on Twitter, um one night and I was talking to Rab Florence about uh, Rocky movies, actually, funnily enough, and I says to him, um, it, it was, I says to him that I was going to uh, the horse races the next day, I was going to my mate Gavin's stag do, and Rab Florence was like, I'm going to the horse races the next day, so I was like, oh, that's a, that's a coincidence kind of thing, so uh, we, I, we were at the stag do and I turned around and Rab Florence and his, his wife at the time was his girlfriend at the time, sorry, was uh, standing behind me. I was like, "How you doing, man?" Just been talking away to him. He's like, ah, "Listen, I'm doing a, I'm doing a uh, show on a day live. Remember the Rowdy Roddy Piper movie, Day Live?" Yeah. Aye. He says, "I'm doing a show on that in the GFT. You should come along." I says, "I will come along." So I went along, and I was just sitting in the what kind of second row after the there's a divide in the GFT. You know, it's like a stand kind of thing where there's a lower tier and an upper tier. Right. So I was sitting in the second row in the upper tier and Greg Kempel sat right in front of me and I was I just got talking to him before the movie started and stuff like that and then the next day he followed me on Twitter and we had a wee bit of back and forth and then he put on a wrestling show and I was like, ah, I'm going to go to that. I'd never seen any UK wrestling or anything like that and I went to get tickets and the tickets sold out and I couldn't get a ticket. I was like, mm-hmm. ah, well, never thought of anything of it. And the night of the show, one of my mates from work went, listen, I've just been given two tickets for a wrestling show. I'm going to go along for a laugh. Do you want to come with me? I was like, yeah, hey, all right, then I'll go with that. So when I went along and I went, met his missus and his kids and stuff like that, Greg's missus and his kids, and uh, we, we had to laugh and all that. And then at New Year, just out the blue, 
he sent me a, a direct message on Twitter. It was hugging me, right, just after midnight. And he, he says, Chris, I'm putting on another wrestling show. I want you to be my bodyguard on it. And I was like, ha, 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 you shut up. No, I mean, <laughs> he's like, no, I'm serious. It's a, a visual gag because I'm so tall, because you're so short. I mean, I right, cool, I'll do it because I, I didn't think I would be getting involved in any of the matches or anything like that. But the show comes and they tell me that I'm getting in the ring and breaking up a pinfall. And then a guy whose name at the time is Adam Shane, people know him as uh, Coach Trip. He was uh, Rav Florence's bodyguard and he drops to his knees and puts a head on me, splits my eyebrow open. Very first show, I didn't know what I was doing or anything like that, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, fucking hell, backstage. <laughs> He's carried me backstage, I was like, was that all right? He went, ah, he says, did I hit you? I'm like, no, I don't think so. He went, how's your eyebrows split open? I never even felt it because the adrenaline was pure pumping through me. But uh, after that, Mark Dallas was at that show, and he contacted me, and he went like, listen, I thought you'd done really well. He says, would you be interested in coming to work with ICW at some point? I says, I no bother. And then nothing happened for a wee while. And I was in the Solid Rock with Dallas, and we went through to Edinburgh for a show uh, about tattoos. I don't know why. Uh, it was, in fact, it was Billy Kipwood. Billy Kipwood was doing a comedy show called Show Me Your Tattoo because it was during the Edinburgh Festival. Mm-hmm. And it was all about his tattoos and the funny stories behind them. And um, we went, and Dallas says, listen, I've got a show the next stage. You want to be on the show? I went, what would I be doing? He's like, you're my right hand man. I says, aye, right, cool, no bother. This was the biggest show that they had done, which was over a thousand people at it, right? But the only show that I had done prior to that was the, in the Kelvin Hall, and there was two and a half thousand people at it. So all the ICW guys are like, oh, let's size that crowd, let's size that crowd, and all that. And me and the people that had done the Kelvin Hall show, I was kind of like that. It's not that big, is it, really? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But then after that, obviously, I, I realised it started to snowball and snowball and snowball, and we were doing bigger venues and bigger venues and bigger venues. Ended up in front of seven and a half thousand at the hydro. You know, I mean, it's just the, the experiences that I've had is like, like I was saying, see, like obviously when I was going to, on the trips with the Celtic team and stuff like that, going being a wrestling fan as a kid and working for ICW, see some of the heroes from my childhood that I've met through it. You know, I mean, I stood in a wrestling ring with Mick Foley, stood in a wrestling ring in front in front of massive crowds with Kevin Nash. You know what I mean? Uh, Kurt Angle, the Dudley boys, see all of these people feel like their, their teenage years and stuff like that. It was all of them. And, you know, I've actually made a lot of really, really good friends through it. And, I mean, yesterday, just for talking sake, yesterday I put up a tweet. It was a, it was a kind of jokey kind of tweet, right? And I put up a picture of a shirt and it was a, it was a dress shirt, but it was all NWO signs, which is a sign out of the wrestling. But they were really small, so for a distance you couldn't notice it. But when you're up close, you see it. I says, would I be an idiot for paying £90 for this? And people were like, uh, oh, you should get it, you should get it, you should get it. And I was that off you getting it. I was that off you buying it. And I got a DM through from one of the boys for the WWE. He's like, my mate makes you their shirts. You'll get it through the post on Wednesday. You know what I mean? And that's just, it's the, the amount of like, great people I've met through wrestling is unbelievable. And friends that I'm going to, have throughout the rest of my life, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yep. I, lot, I, I do consider a lot of them like family, like Mark Dallas and the wee man, Neil Bratch piece, it, they're, like, they're my two closest mates in wrestling, and DCT, who I don't know if you know them, but they three are my, th- my three closest mates through wrestling, and I consider them to be my brothers, man. Honestly, it's it's weird, it's strange, it's, it must be like what it's like playing with a football team, do you know what I mean? And it's just that it's a, it's a phenomenal experience. It really is. You, you know, the, the story you're telling there, Chris, what I like about it is you meet people in this world who want to help you as well. Nothing in return. They're just doing it because they either see something in you that they like or they like you as a person or both. And I think sometimes it's difficult to understand that. You know, why, why is this person assisting me? I got a wee bit of that when I started doing the books, Chris, and people were introducing me to people and, and taking me places. And I'm thinking, why are they doing this? You know, what's in it for them? But I guess that's just something you've got to accept, you know, because they're not doing it just for the sake of it. They're doing it because they're seeing something in you, a, a talent or, or your personality, that they actually want to harness that. So that that's a brilliant story. And the fact that you're meeting people that will be with you for the rest of your life as friends, you know, lifelong friends. And where else has this led? Has this led you into moving into the kind of acting side of things as well and being on TV, Chris? 
honestly, it's, it's crazy. See that, that conversation with Rab Florence on Twitter that night? It completely changed the course of my life. Mm-hmm. And it's no, uh, that's not even an exaggeration. You know what I mean? He, like, like I said, he's obviously helped me. But what happened was that when I came into ICW and we were doing that big show, that first big show that I was on, right? We were... ICW were filming a documentary for the BBC called Insane Fight Club. Right? I don't know if you've seen it, but it was it was huge when it came out. We we get more viewers than the Champions League that night and everything like that. Honestly, it was crazy, and that came out. And I wasn't one of the featured people on it, but the guy that came in um, and started directing the second one he said that he'd spoke to me a few times and he wanted me to be featured on this a second documentary, Insane Fight Club Two. And it was just that it was a pure whirlwind for then. I, I had to leave my, I didn't leave my job, I had to take time out from my job to go down to Leeds that night, right, went down to Leeds, we done some stuff in Leeds and we went on to Newcastle, I was in a bar drinking with all the arseholes for the job to show, you know what I mean, right, and it was crazy, it was, honestly it was crazy, and we were, we were on a boat with fucking Jimmy Corkill, I bet I wasn't there, but it was, the, like, we were on a boat with Jimmy Corkill and you know, it's just surreal shit that started happening really quickly, right? And then the documentary aired in Saint Fight Club 2, and it was even bigger than the first one. Mm-hmm. And we, we trended number one in the UK, and we trended worldwide that night, right? And on Twitter. And the next day, I get a phone call for Judge Rinder, right? Honest, this is, this is no lie, I swear to you, I swear to you, right? I get a phone call for Judge Rinder. Hi, uh, hi, Chris, we're big fans of your work. All right, okay. My, my work? All right, then. <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, um, listen, does, um, do you ever have any problem getting paid from Mark Dallas when you're working for ICW? And I went like, no. Why? He uh, says, we walk in the door, we get our wages, and mm-hmm. it goes in our skyrocket, and then we do the show. We get paid before we do the show. He's like, uh, right, okay, no problem. Do you think Mark would come on and we could we could work out something where we could maybe give you about £7,500? And I was like, I'll phone you back in a minute. <laughs> I phoned Dallas. I was like, listen, mate, I says, they've watched that documentary last night. They want to get us on Judge Rinder. He's like, what? Judge Rinder? Aye. What do we need to do? I was like, I need to say you can't, you don't pay me. He went like, mate, that's going to do us more, more damage in the long run. And I says, you're absolutely right. I says, but they're offering us seven and a half grand. He went like, that would be nice, but no, we're going to make a lot more than fucking seven and a half grand in the long run, you know what I mean? Exactly. That, that then happened, and then a, f- a few weeks later, I got a phone call from the comedy unit in Glasgow. She said, Chris, uh, your name's been put forward to his about coming in for an audition for Scott Squad. I was like, all right. And I, I knew that Grado had done Scott Squad, and Neil had done Scott Squad as well. Um, and it was it was they two who put my name forward, actually, Grado and Neil. And I went, right, okay. I, th- I thought, you know what? I've got fucking nothing to lose. I'll go in, I'll get a bash. And I always loved doing improv comedy and in school, so I was like, I'll get, I'll get a, a black, why not? Went in, uh, done it, and they're like, oh, brilliant, come back, I want you to bring in a character, we're going to do a face-to-face interview with you and your character, mm-hmm. so you had to go in with your, your own kind of character thing, I was like, alright, fuck, what do I do? So I contacted Darren Connell, who, uh, another big Celtic fan actually, um, who's, who plays Bobby on Scott Squad, right? and he says, do you know what, just go in and treat them like shit, basically. I went like, ah, right, fuck it. He says, but make up a nickname for them. Make up a nickname, and that's where Shagger came from. I went in, I went in on the on the audition, and I sat down. I went, all right, Shagger. And the guy started pissing himself off, and I was like, oh, you're beauty. I might, I might be onto something here. Oh. So eventually, I got the role, and then obviously filmed it. Done. It went viral everywhere. No, it was, it was millions and millions of views all over the place. And then um, after that, I kind of. I kind of took a wee back seat. I started concentrating more on the ICW thing. Um, acting was never, it, it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life, but I'm, I'm, I am think I'm all right at it, do you know what I mean? So if if the jobs come along, then that's all well and good. But unfortunately, I'm a wee bit busy at the moment, so there's, there's no jobs coming right now for me. But we'll see. I filmed something just before the lockdown. Hopefully, if they can manage to get the rest of that filmed, it was literally the day before the lockdown that I filmed this thing. Um, if they can manage to get it, to get the rest of it filmed, then that'll be on BBC as well. And 
I think this will be a good one, I know. I think a lot of people like this one, I know, because it was fucking fun filming it, I'll tell you that. Well, that's, that's as much as I can tell you about it, but... But the thing is, Chris, see, you're talking there, and listening to that story, it's it's incredible, because it is, it sounds like a, to use a cliche, it sounds like a whirlwind, right? But what I always say about people that have that success, and, and obviously, it's because they're taking the opportunities, though. It would be easy for you not to have gone to the races. It'd be easy for you not to turn up or, you know, get time off your work and travel away down south to Leeds. And I think that that's the big thing. You're actually very well being given an opportunity, but you've got to grasp it, you know? So, fair play to you, Chris. I get brought up, my dad's a huge fan of Only Fools and Horses, and you know what they say, he who Dells wins, mate. Exactly. No, you're spot on. And, I mean, do you, do you see yourself doing anything with the club? Anything with Celtic? Is there anything that you I think you could fit in? I would fucking love to work for Celtic in some way, shape or form. Man. I, would like, I actually applied for the job as a uh, social media guy. Right. That's mm-hmm. uh, my actual job. I work in social media. So right. it's, I applied for the, for the role as a social media uh, manager with Celtic. I never even got a fucking letter back telling me. No response. <laughs> never, oh, never even got a no thank you for them. Do you know what I mean? But That's could be lost my message yeah. just to work for Rangers and she gets sacked when she was half sick. So <laughs> Nightmare. The, the thing with Celtic, I guess, is that as well as the football, they're putting on festivals, they're doing a lot of live stuff, Chris. There's there is the comedy element and there's all this kind of stuff. So I'm pretty sure at some point they'll be coming back and chapping on your door, Chris, and it's up to you whether or not you you take it, you know. So you know what the best part is a date for nothing. A date for nothing. That's the best part. You know what? I've, I've, no, I wouldn't date for nothing. They're oh. fucking pumping off money into that club. They can give <laughs> exactly. me some back. <laughs> You've been on the chartered flights never into Dortmund and Lisbon, man. Exactly. That costs a pretty penny. This isn't any old Joe Blogs off the street we're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> Listen, Chris, hopefully once this lockdown passes, we can maybe do this again face to face. And uh, it, it's been a brilliant chat this evening. And I really appreciate your time. So... Uh, over the next few weeks you take care of yourself and hopefully I'll see you again Chris all the best to you and the family I hope everybody's nice and safe same to yourself pal all the very best mate right thanks very much Paul see you soon thanks Chris thank you